Hello everybody. We've been doing things here on the channel for so long that I now have quite a few different playlists running, grouping certain types of cars together. There are some obvious things like my German legends, the JDM icons, but one of my favorite playlists is the cool cars for young people. Affordable yet interesting machinery that you can buy and run on a very small budget. Now when a man called Shutan got in touch with me and offered me his Mark 1 Ford Focus to review, I leapt at the chance. But I must confess, this is not at all the car I was expecting. What I was thinking was going to turn up was an absolute dog. A nice, raggedy, battle-worn, mostly rusted out, old heap of shod. What instead arrived was an absolutely gorgeous, pristine 2004 Mark 1 Focus Edge. I was absolutely blown away by the condition of this car. It turned up having driven all the way from London looking like it had just been freshly detailed. You could have told me this had been pulled straight out of a museum somewhere and I would believe you. This isn't a car that's never been driven. It's got 52 and a half thousand miles on the clock but it is in absolutely pristine condition and therefore presents a few interesting questions for me. The main one being, is a car like this worth buying? And the secondary question, and perhaps the most important one being, is a car like this worth keeping, worth saving, and worth the effort? I've never really been a big Ford fan, or indeed really much of a hatchback person. In fact, my adoration for hatchbacks is something I've only really discovered in the last few years. When I was younger, I was more into saloons, coupes, sporty cars, that kind of thing. Most of my mates drove hatchbacks, but actually when I was about 17 or 18, I didn't even have a car at all. When I got my driving license at the tail end of 2006, this is exactly the kind of car that you would have found pretty much every single street in Britain. And usually in this color too, this sort of weird icy bluey silver type thing that it actually wears very well. This car was incredibly important for Ford and as it turns out really the automotive industry as a whole. This really was the template for a hatchback of the 2000s. It replaced the outgoing and aging Escort lineup and really for many people this was the car of their youth. Now exactly which version you had would of course depend on how well healed you are and what your insurance company would let you play with. This 1.6 Sigma engined car is pretty representative of your average kind of focus. Now this is a run out model, an Edge, so it got a, a few different upgrades but wasn't the fully featured luxury car that the gear pretended to be. Now we do have to wind the clock back just a little bit and remind ourselves of what would be considered a luxury at this point in time. So you have such things as ABS, alloy wheels, electric front windows, you have air conditioning, but you don't have electric wing mirror adjust, you don't have, I believe, any traction control, not that you really need it with those rampant 100 horses up front and several torques, nor is there really any leather in here at all, apart from maybe on the steering wheel, but I think this is probably vinyl. However, what you did get was, I think, one of the finest pieces of modern automotive design. We may not really think of it in such a way because, let's face it, once upon a time these were obscenely common. And familiarity breeds complacency. You don't really appreciate what is there. Well, it being so long since I saw one of these, when it turned up there were all sorts of things I don't think I ever noticed that suddenly became apparent. The fact that the glass on it goes almost all the way from front to back. In fact, the rear window meets the rear tail lights. At the front, the shape of the grille has been integrated into the headlight cover so it looks like one seamless piece where in fact it's an optical illusion. Visibility is superb. Modern cars you feel like you're sat in a bathtub with the window starting only fairly high up and then a huge B pillar next to you obscuring your vision. Not so here. The glass goes down to the floor it feels like, B pillar is miles back there and you can see everything. Really such a good piece of design. Now I'll um, confess there that uh, I had to stop for a moment because I was almost convinced that we hadn't shut the bonnet properly. 
the bonnet incidentally you open with the key very old school Ford thing the key itself is an item that's somewhat familiar to me because Lotus are still using it in the Evora in 2021 as they are the indicator stalks and they wonder why I moan about them But yes, the bonnet looks like it's loose and open, such as the uh, Ford build quality of the time. But that's not a problem, because this is a cheap car, it pretty much always was. And these days you can pick up a working MOT laden example of one of these for about 500 odd pounds. That however is likely to be a car with a few issues. The biggest killers of these were a combination of rust, and repair bills. Rust, of course, being a very common enemy to many cars, particularly of this age. The repair bills bit is really quite sad, but when you've got a car that's worth only maybe a few hundred pounds, if you get a repair bill of a few hundred quid to fix it, the temptation is always going to be just to sell it for scrap or parts and then change to something else. This car, as it proudly wears the badge on the back, is also one that survived the Great Purge, which was the government scrappage scheme. A great idea and one that did help invigorate the automotive industry when it was in need. Something I think we should maybe bring back, especially help encourage people into new, more environmentally friendly cars rather than just punishing them for only old ones. But the unintentional side effect of this whole thing was that there was something of a purge of not necessarily true classics. Not many people were chucking E-types in the scrapper, but Decent cars like this, which really had plenty of years life left in them, often saw their way into the scrap man's hands. And unfortunately, I do know a few scrappies who desperately wanted to save some of these cars. But sadly, the law was very strict. Once the car was sent off for scrappage, it had to be destroyed. Clutching this is really, really high and quite tricky to operate. I have very unpleasant memories driving a Focus because it was the sort of car I learned to drive in. A Mark II though, because I learned with the AA, and that was similarly difficult. You've got an engine with next to no torque, a clutch that doesn't really talk to you, is really quite high, and that is a recipe for getting things quite badly wrong. Even now, with many years of experience, it's not the most natural or easy thing to drive. But once you're on the move, it's absolutely fine. Very quiet in here, totally standard car, standard exhaust, and the ride quality is very pleasant. In fact, this introduced a very trick piece of design. The front suspension is conventional McPherson struts. However, the rear is what Ford called the control blade suspension. Now, typically, you'd find in a hatchback of this kind a, a torsion beam suspension, which is a, a fairly simple but very space efficient way of damping the rear of your car. Now, on bigger vehicles, you want some sort of fully independent rear suspension, but that comes with cost, complexity, and also it takes up a lot of space. Ford designed for this car the control blade suspension, which is essentially a way of getting a multi-link rear into the back of the car, but not taking up really much more space than a regular torsion beam, and they managed to produce it at a very reasonable cost. A five-speed gearbox in here is really very slick, feels absolutely good as the day it was born. I mean, really, I'm amazed at how decent this is because, okay, this car's clearly been cared for, it's clearly been looked after, but, you know, time will have its wicked way with these things, and yet still, this is absolute joy. I'm really looking forward to hooning this car down the road. I know it's not going to be especially fast, but that, I think, is why I'm looking forward to enjoying it quite so much. It's ever so slightly damp out there today. The tyres on here are decent. They're reasonably fresh. So you know this is the kind of car you can have a lot of fun in, and you're not really going to get in that much trouble. Let's put the theory to the test, shall we? In the background there are notes of a real classic twin cam soundtrack. You've got to of course work the gears somewhat, it's, it's actually geared about right I would say for this kind of car. You do have to work the gearbox if you want to get the best from it but that's absolutely fine, it's all part of the joy. And it's geared pretty sensibly too. At 60 mile an hour in fifth gear we're doing about 2,500 RPM so at 70 you, you're probably still going to be doing below 3 grand. You can indeed heel and toe or rev match in it quite easily. 
and the chassis is an absolute delight. Its ultimate limits are, are fairly low, of course they are, but it just works so well. It's actually reasonably supple here, and you have to remember, this is not a sporty model, this is just the edge. Now we do have to remind ourselves, this is not an RS, this is not an overtly sporty model. It might have what Ford called the sports suspension on it, but I'm, I'm not so sure about that, or indeed how sporty said suspension was. When you get it into a corner, there's just a little moment for it to load up. We can feel the suspension taking the weight of the car, but once it's done that and it's settled, you've actually got a decent level of adjustability in it, and the car is quite keen to play. But it absorbs the lumps and bumps really quite well, so you can carry a fair bit of speed through these bends. It's just as well, because that engine really isn't providing much punch at all. Nothing to be surprised about there. The visibility in this thing is great, because it means you can place the car with absolute pinpoint precision. I'm just amazed at how tight this whole thing is. There's no creaks, there's no rattles, there's no squeaks. I've been driving around recently in an Alfa Romeo Giulietta that's half this car's age, and that feels far, far more tired. Granted, it's probably had a, a much harder life being a courtesy car and all that jazz, but still, we all think of these Fords as something that's just going to fall apart after the warranty expires, and this is proof that that doesn't need to happen. This is absolutely delightful. I mean, I'm holding the car at like 3,000 RPM, about fourth gear, you put your foot down, it just makes more noise. It doesn't really go any quicker at all, but I feel good about it. This brings me back to a youth that I, I didn't really ever have. I never really hoofed about in hatchbacks, but I get why people did. I really do. There is room in the back for your mates. There is plenty of space in the boot. Now, if you're looking at buying one of these, not so much as a, a primary car, but as a classic, it's going to cost you buttons to run. And some might laugh at the notion of a Mark I Focus as being a classic. I would very, very strongly disagree. It may not be quite yet, but it really isn't far off. These have already had their sort of extinction level event with the scrappage scheme, and the survivors are made up of those cars that are just about on the road and may likely be turned into parts soon, or examples like this. And if you have something like this, please, please, you owe it to the world to keep it in good fettle, but also use it and enjoy it. <laughs> this is a wonderful car. You notice little pieces of design too, that show you Ford really were putting their all into this car. You have a, a tiny little drawer up here, maybe for coins or oddments, and this mystery compartment for smuggling all sorts of stuff just above your 12 volt socket. The AC even still blows ice cold, and in fact it's very important in cars of this vintage to keep the AC running most of the year round, because that will actually help it stay in good condition. I know there's a temptation to modify cars like this, and I think I would maybe put a little cone filter in there or something, just so you get a tiny bit more of that soundtrack, but actually, here as a pristine, unmolested example of a car, I think maybe that would just be wrong. I know people would want to put coilovers or lowering springs or all sorts of stuff on a car like this, but no, don't do it. Ford got this absolutely, completely right. I still have yet to try a Mark 1 RS. That's one of the unicorn cars I've always been trying to find for the channel. But you really can have a lot of fun driving this. I've taken all sorts of cars down this road recently. Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Aston Martins, Porsches. I'm having just as much fun in a Mark 1 Focus as anything else. Maybe I'm not going as fast, making as much noise, or feeling quite as baller. But that doesn't stop you enjoying driving. It really doesn't. Now here's the best bit. Like I said earlier, you can pick up a, a ropey Mark 1 Focus for something like 500 quid, but in all fairness, it's not really going to be a car that's economically viable. You'd never want to try and get a car like that into the same condition as something like this. Y you're going to spend far too much doing it. However, this car was picked up for the princely sum of £1,500. That is an absolute bargain. If you are thinking of entering into the world of the classic car, but you're really just not sure you want to dip your toes entirely in there yet, 
do seriously give a Mark I Focus a try. You might think it's not a classic, but this is one of the last they made. This is already 17 years old. The early ones are over 20. It was hugely important, both for the company who made it and the people who bought it. It's a real proper design classic, I think. The new edge kind of styling that Ford introduced with this car dictated what the company's vehicles were going to look like for the next sort of decade and a half. And as the numbers go down, the values of decent ones remaining can only really go in one direction, and that is up. Today's video is all ready to have a bit of a laugh, taking the mickey out of a scraggly old knackered focus. And I'm so, so glad that this turned up in its stead because it's given me an entirely new perspective on this car that I've always known was important, but I've never really cared much for. And, as I said, this is going to be going in my series of cool cars for young people. And if you are about 17 or 18, you're about as old as this car. And you're looking at it going, oh, why would I want one of those? Trust me, if you buy something like this, in this condition, it isn't going to cost you a lot of money. 1,500 quid is the deposit on many other cars you could get. But this really will get you a lot of respect from your fellow elder petrol heads because you don't see these like this anymore. And we appreciate that. Larger engine variants of this car were available, but there's something of a purity about the sort of 1.6 litre formula with around 100 horsepower. It's the starting point for so many people's automotive journeys, and so I think there's always going to be something of a nostalgic association with it. So there we have it. That is a look at a gorgeous 2004 Ford Focus Mark 1 Edge 1.6. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.